appeared in Birmingham ended when Priestley's house, laboratory, and church were ransacked by a church and king mob in 1791 on the second anniversary of the storming of the Bastille, targeting Priestley as a high-profile supporter of the French Revolution, as well as a religious heretic. Priestley emigrated to America in 1794 and died there 10 years later. So, I mean, that's just a very brief whistle-stop tour of his amazing life. But despite his manifold achievements, Priestley is now most widely remembered as the brilliant yet misguided experimental chemist who discovered oxygen but failed to recognize the true meaning of what he had discovered. Due to his attachment, we already heard, to the phlogiston theory, which he continued to advocate to his grave. Many of his admirers, including the people who wrote this blue plaque, admire him as the discoverer of oxygen. Though Priestley himself would be turning in his grave with that plaque, because he insisted on calling it by his own name, dephlogisticated air. By many scientists and historians of science, Priestley is only known as the anti-hero of the chemical revolution, who stood in the way of the progress being brought by Lavoisier, the great Lavoisier. William Brock, who gave that Sox lecture that Alan presided over, he sums up the attitude of later chemists who have uneasily celebrated Priestley who in fact provided the inspiration for the formation of the American Chemical Society in 1874. That was at a gathering in Priestley's honor, uh, celebrating the centenary of his discovery of oxygen. And that gathering was actually held in his old house in rural Pennsylvania. So they got much more than a medal um, to thank him for. Now, Brock sums it up like this, the, the attitude of um, chemist. What they could not understand from their later perspective was why Priestley had failed to grasp that Lavoisier had developed a superior explanation. And they, the modern chemist, found his post-1800 stand for phlogiston and the arguments for the compound nature of water embarrassing and silly. End of quote. This kind of view began very early, for example, with the great French naturalist Georges Cuvier, who quipped that Priestley was a father of modern chemistry, but, I quote, a father who never wanted to acknowledge his daughter, end of quote. J.R. Partington, well known to many of you, no doubt, 20th century chemist and master historian of chemistry, declared that, I quote, Priestley's obstinate retention of theoretical and some experimental errors retarded the progress of chemistry. These sentiments have been repeated by many historians, philosophers, and popularizers of science. Priestley was blinded by, by dogma, we hear. He was just too old and set in his ways to be able to accept Lavoisier's new ideas, they say. This, I maintain, is a serious misunderstanding of Priestley's science. And this misunderstanding also gets in the way of our understanding of the true spirit of his life and work in general. Now, there has, of course, been a great deal of informative historical research about Priestley's life and work. However, when it comes to his chemistry, even today's well-informed professional historians of science have mostly given misguided, puzzled, or apologetic accounts of his contributions. In the last several years, I have pieced together a revisionary account of the chemical revolution and Priestley's role in it, which I have summarized now in the first chapter of this book, which Alan has kindly mentioned. The, the paper he mentioned at the end has actually been published and its content also incorporated into the first chapter here. According to my understanding, which builds on the work of some other historians, such as John McAvoy, Robert Schofield, Maurice Crossland, Larry Holmes, Douglas Olchin, 
Priestley, Priestley was not at all an irrational and dogmatic adherent to a defeated theory. Priestley's phlogiston chemistry, in my judgment, was as correct and valuable as Lavoisier's new chemistry, and in various ways even superior to it. The dogmatic part in this story was not Priestley, but actually Lavoisier and his colleagues, who started with a sincere and earnest desire to modernize chemistry, but whose impatience and arrogance resulted in what was by, dubbed by one observer the imperial despotism of oxygen. And please don't ask me in the question period who said that because it's gone out of my mind. <laughs> I will find it if you want, and you can email me about that. So if I can convince you of this revisionary account of Priestley's scientific work, we can then have a much clearer and more coherent picture of him as a champion of a thoroughly enlightened and liberal society who preached tolerance and pluralism in religion, politics, and science alike. Priestley's was a true spirit of the Enlightenment, according to which science could flourish as a part of a liberal culture. And 280 years after his birth, we can still draw many lessons of modernity from his ideas. So I must now get on to Priestley's chemistry. If I can benefit from one of his old inventions. But no instructions about how to open the bottle. Ah, thank you. I will come to artificially carbonated water later on. Now, at least in this building, I trust I won't get complaints that my talk contained too much chemistry, which I often get. First, I must make some introductory explanations for those of you not familiar with this about the concept of phlogiston, that notorious concept, and the uses that Priestley and his kindred spirits in chemistry made of it. So what was the reason for postulating this odd concept, phlogiston? The initial intuition came from observing combustion. So suppose I set a light, something like this, the flame and a great deal of heat will come out. And you may wonder, where was all of that in this cold, stable, unexciting object? So you can understand that people might have thought, well, well, the fire must have been contained in the combustible substance, albeit in a latent form. So that's the initial naive notion of phlogiston. So something like wood is actually a compound in their view of what you get after the combustion, the ashes, plus this element of fire. That's the start, but it gets much better than that. Later chemists, particularly uh, Georg Stahl in Germany, styled phlogiston as the principle, so-called, of inflammability. The principle here is an old style chemical term not meaning an abstract rule, but a, a substance, an active substance, which imparts to other substances that it combines with some characteristic properties. So phlogiston's characteristic property was combustibility. But later chemists also, um, well, starting from Stahl, recognized it as the principle of what we might call metallicity. In other words, um, metals were rich in this substance, and that's what made them metallic. Now, you may hear, eh, that's a nice, you may, you may think that this is a nice fairy tale. I mean, anybody can make up a story about what things are made up of. So you might demand that uh, phlogiston theorists make good of their claim that a metal is composed of phlogiston and what's left after it combust. Now I say combust because we now consider metals actually can combust. But um, before Priestley, what they noticed was that metals, well, we would now say they rust. Yes. Either by just exposure to air or, uh, over a long time, or if you heat it, 
quite strong need to help it along. Uh, shiny metal would turn into this rusty, crumbly, earthy looking stuff, which they call calx. Right? So they imagine that in this process of so-called calcination, the phlogiston that was contained in the metal would escape, leaving this ash-like stuff accounts. So you might want to challenge the phlogiston theorist and say, well, if that's your story, show us, maybe can you do the opposite? In other words, can you take a calx, give it some phlogiston, turn it back into metal? Now, an interesting answer about to that question came, uh, originated in the work of another famous phlogistonist, Henry Cavendish about whom I could tell you a lot, but I don't have time for that today. Cavendish did this, this kind of experiment, right, in which a piece of metal is dunked in a rather dilute acid, and it dissolves while giving off this gas, which you see there. And now we say that's hydrogen gas. Uh, that name is due to Lavoisier, so we don't have this yet. This is in pre Cavendish's 1766 publication. And Cavendish called it inflammable air because he collected it and tested its properties and realized that it, it would burn. Quite a peculiar thing, an air that burns. And so he called it inflammable air. Now, I had a... a foreign student questioned me about this. He said, is inflammable a word that means not flammable? <laughs> so I had to just sit him down and say, do not expect rationality from the English language. <laughs> it's exactly the same thing as flammable. Now, I'll tell you in just a moment why I showed you that little experiment. So I posed that question earlier. Uh, we can challenge the phlogiston theorist and say, can you turn the calx back into metal by adding phlogiston to it? And there are two answers to this, one, well, both meaning yes. The first answer is yes, you can, and people have been doing this for thousands of years. What happens in the smelting of metallic ores? So the notion goes like this. Metallic ores are full of, we now say oxides, but they said calces, right? So there's a calx of a metal contained in the ore. And how do you get the pure metal out of it? Well, you will mix it up with charcoal and heat it. That's the smelting process. But the way the phlogiston theorists made sense of this is the following. Well, in order to give the calx some phlogiston, we have to mix it up with a substance that's rich in phlogiston. What does that mean? Something quite combustible, like charcoal and then heat it. Why? Because that's what chemists did when they didn't know what else to do. And they said the charcoal will, well, does impart its phlogiston to the calx, turning it into metal, and itself be reduced to ash after its combustion. Isn't that wonderfully coherent and sensible? And then it gets better with the help of Cavendish's work, because in the form of inflammable air, which Cavendish had first considered pure phlogiston and later uh, revised as phlogisticated water, you can do a much cleaner experiment than the smelting process. And this is a schematic picture of it that I've drawn. Uh, this is as Priestley performed it. So he had a calx resting on a little stand enclosed in inflammable air, inverted a glass jar here over water, and he got a big lens, a burning glass, as he called it. He had one that was uh, 16 inches, I think, in diameter, very big, and focused sunlight on it for very clean heating. And he predicts, right, that the calx would imbibe, his word, the phlogiston in the inflammable air and be reduced to the matter. And that's precisely what happened when he did this experiment. And he saw even the water level here going up. So he's thinking the calx really is drinking up the phlogiston. Perfect. 
Now, uh, there's a long story about how Lavoisier then reinterpreted this experiment in his own terms, and I will come to that in the questions if you'd like. But for now, the point is this, that the phlogiston theory was not only quite sensible when you think about, when you learn to think about it in its own terms, but it was also able to predict a new phenomenon, as here, and the prediction was vindicated. Now, let me come to Lavoisier. I don't want to go into the full technical details today about the arguments back and forth that constituted the so-called chemical revolution. But I'm going to introduce some key points that will hopefully go a long way towards showing you why Priestley and some other great chemists like Cavendish were never convinced by Lavoisier's new chemistry. There are three major reasons, one of which I'll explain in some detail, the other two I'll do quickly. So the first one is this. Even though Lavoisier's chemistry had great merits, I, I'm not going to stand here and deny that, but it had its own difficulties, some of them quite serious. The very name oxygen, which you see here in Lavoisier's famous table of elements or simple substances, that name oxygen is a giveaway to one of the serious difficulties that Lavoisier's theory had. Some of you know this story already. What does oxygen mean? It's a word that Lavoisier made up from Greek roots, meaning the generator of acids. Oxy meaning sharp or acidic or sour because Lavoisier believed that oxygen was the principle of acidity, that all acids contained oxygen. And you have the famous story of Humphrey Davy showing him wrong on that count through his work on chlorine and hydrochloric acid. But already at the time, people knew that things like hydrochloric acid, what they called muriatic acid, didn't contain any oxygen, or rather they were not able to isolate any oxygen from it. And here, this table actually shows you something quite interesting. So in French, on, in this column are the new names that Lavoisier gave to things. Um, on this column, you have the old names. So oxygen used to be called the phlogisticated air or imperial air, vital air, and so on. You look down here. He has something called the muriatic radical which was the stuff you were supposed to get if you took oxygen out of muriatic acid. And what is that stuff? Well, on the right-hand side, we have anconu, unknown. <laughs> there isn't such a thing we would now say. Anyway, so Lavoisier's theory had that straightforward difficulty that, that he had an entirely incorrect theory of the nature of acids of which he was, however, so proud that he named his beloved oxygen according to that theory. Now, you may set that aside as something not quite central to his, um, his chemistry. But consider something else here on this table. Now, set aside the first one of his chemical elements, which is Lumiere light. The second one is caloric, the element of heat. Now, anyone inclined to denounce Priestley for believing in this hypothetical, imponderable, meaning weightless, principle of phlogiston should at least have the courtesy to apply the same criticism to Lavoisier's caloric, which is also exactly like that. But you might say, why did Lavoisier need that thing? Well, it wasn't an idle presupposition in Lavoisier's system. Rather, it was quite central, among other things, to Lavoisier's new theory of combustion. And I have to run through this because it is a crucial point. So what is Lavoisier's great modern idea about combustion? Well, we all know that it's uh, the idea that combustion is combination with oxygen, you know, forming an oxide. But then you might ask a naive yet important question. What's combination with oxygen got to do with heat and light coming out of it? Why would that generate any heat? And now we tell the story in terms of energy 
Paul Lavoisier is working 80 years before the conservation of energy comes up. So how is he going to explain it? He explains it as follows. He says, aha, uh -huh. that's all to do with the fact that the oxygen participating in combustion is in the form of a gas. And he said, what is oxygen gas? It's this uh, very substantive material base, as he called it, plus lots of caloric. He said, any gas is a combination of a material base. Well, caloric is material too, but a ponderable weighted base plus lots of caloric. And how do you make sense of it? Well, Lavoisier said, how do you make a gas? You make it by heating a liquid. How do you make a liquid? You make it by heating a solid. So as you add more and more heat to stuff, it goes from solid to liquid, liquid to gas. So he says when oxygen gas combines with the combustible substance, the oxygen base combines with the combustible substance, leaving behind the caloric in its free form, which we then perceive as heat. So Lavoisier's theory of combustion essentially involved this hypothetical substance caloric, I would say, no better, even judged from the modern point of view, than your notorious phlogiston. And even if you accept, which I do, that the caloric theory of Lavoisier had many, many great merits, and it made perfect sense for him to maintain it, even if you accept the caloric theory, there are even so internal problems in his theory of combustion. And this, these are four main points summarized later, slightly later, by Thomas Thompson. And I'll just quickly point you to two things. One, um, Thompson points out, as many other people did before him, if Lavoisier's theory is right, that, that combustion is the reduction of oxygen gas, or rather separation of oxygen gas, releasing the caloric and getting the base to combine with the combustible, how come there's no combustion when other gases combine with other substances? Because we, we all learned from Lavoisier that all gases contain lots of caloric. So what's special about oxygen? Lavoisier couldn't explain. And then the second point here is to say that you can have combustion without oxygen in the gaseous state. The most famous example of this was gunpowder. And in fact, Bertolet pointed this out before he converted to Lavoisier. So without giving you all the details, I'm just pointing out that there were quite significant difficulties with Lavoisier's chemistry. So while phlogiston theory had its difficulties for sure, difficulties were on both sides. So that's the first point about why Priestley and others were not convinced by Lavoisier. I'll make the two additional points quite briefly. The second point is that there are concerns of chemistry that Lavoisier's chemistry left out. Because Lavoisier's chemistry was very focused on the relationship between combining substances and their products in terms of weight. He was very, very meticulous and consistent in tracking the weights that go between uh, the ingredients and the products of chemical reactions. But in his focus on weight and tracking the combination of chemicals in the way you might track the blocks of Lego that you play with, he lost sight of other things. For example, wanting to explain why chemicals had the properties they did. So for the phlogistonist, there are very nice explanations you can have, right? If you give something phlogiston, that compound will take on combustibility and metallicity and so on. Lavoisier couldn't care less about whether you could have that kind of explanation. So there are things that the old phlogiston chemistry did that the Lavoisierian chemistry didn't do. And the third point is that for Priestley and others, the phlogiston theory had, a, had been a very productive framework, leading to many chemical discoveries, right? Ten or so new gases that Priestley discovered in his lab, following his phlogistonist intuitions, just to give you the most straightforward example. And what had Lavoisier discovered that actually people like Cavendish and Priestley hadn't 
As the great German chemist Justus Liebig once put it, perhaps in a particularly nationalistic moment, Lavoisier discovered nothing new, he said, but only presented other people's discoveries in a new framework. So in short, I believe there were insufficient grounds for giving up a productive old theory in favor of a sterile new one. Now, something also needs to be said about the character of knowledge that Priestley pursued. And how different that was from the Lavoisierian idea. Priestley was clearly in an exploratory mode in his experimental work, most concerned about capturing all the variety of phenomena in all their details. The theories available to him were merely hypotheses providing temporary understanding of phenomena, always poised to be overthrown by better hypotheses. Priestley endeavored to explain all the major phenomena produced and observed in the lab, even if the explanations got a bit messy in the more difficult cases. In contrast, Lavoisier prized simplicity greatly, especially the kind of simplicity that you might call elegance. Lavoisier and his supporters like to focus their attention on paradigmatic cases in which their theoretical conceptions worked out beautifully, leaving the messier cases aside. Now, a good example to illustrate this point is about the calcination of metals and the very experiments that Priestley had made in order to produce oxygen and Lavoisier repeated to reach his own understanding. So that's the case of the so-called red calx of mercury, red oxide of mercury. Now, this is a peculiar substance, right? Because what happens in the production and reduction of red oxide of mercury is that it only purely happens by heat. So you can heat mercury um, in ordinary air, and then it becomes this red oxide. And then the oxide or calx could be turned back into the metal simply by a higher degree of heat, which Priestley and Lavoisier achieved by the burning lens. This wonderful exhibition of oxidation and reduction was cited over and over by the Lavoisierians, eclipsing all other cases of calcination and reduction. Priestley, however, pointed out I quote, but this is the case of only this particular calx of this particular matter. So in Priestley's view, the Lavoisierians were distorting the picture by focusing on one exceptional case because other metals behave differently. For example, Priestley observed that no calx of iron could be revived or reduced unless it be heated in inflammable air, which it eagerly imbibes or in contact with some other substance which has been supposed to contain phlogiston. That was a quote from Priestley, as you can imagine. Lavoisier, from his side, could not tolerate the continual complications and mutually conflicting changes that Priestley and other phlogistonists made to their theories in their attempts to meet the challenges posed by various new phenomena. So what it comes down to is that to Priestley and other phlogistonists, Lavoisier's new chemistry was an attractive but overly simplistic and inadequate system, which the Lavoisierians tried to impose on others in a hasty and high-handed manner. Dogmatism was the greatest defect that Priestley perceived in Lavoisierian chemistry. In his latter-day defense of phlogiston theory published in 1796 from his American exile, Priestley averred that, I quote, free discussion must always be favorable to the cause of truth, unquote, and reminded the reader of the non-dogmatic path that he had walked in science. I quote again, no person acquainted with my philosophical publications can say that I appear to have been particularly attached to any hypothesis. As I have frequently avowed a change of opinion and have more than once expressed an inclination for the new theory, Lavoisier's theory, especially that very important part of it, the decomposition of water, end of quote. 
Now, you might suspect that this was a retrospective self-fashioning by a loser. But no, Priestley had expressed very similar epistemic views at the height of his fame and success. For example, in the very letter in which he announced the discovery of deflogisticated air, he wrote, I quote, it is happy when, when, with a fertility of invention sufficient to raise hypotheses, a person is not apt to acquire too great attachment to them, to the hypothesis. By this means, they lead to the discovery of new facts, and from a sufficient number of these new facts, the true theory of nature will easily result. End of quote. That he wrote just after proposing this peculiar idea that nitrous acid is the basis of common air and nitre is formed by a decomposition of the atmosphere. And immediately after that, he added, but I may think otherwise tomorrow. <laughs> In contrast, there was a clear absolutist impulse on the oxygen side, perhaps the most uh, perhaps most egregiously manifested in, in this occasion at which they ceremonially burnt Stahl's phlogistonist book, dressed up uh, in, in peculiar costumes, led by Madame Lavoisier. Now, the preface to the 1796 book I mentioned just a minute ago is a moving document as well as a chilling one. Priestley, in this book, dedicates it to the post-Lavoisier leaders of French chemistry, Bertolet, Laplace, Mons, Mauveau, Foucault, and Hassan France, and requested an answer from them to his objections to the oxygen system. And Priestley drew a parallel between the politics of science and the larger politics that had put a premature end to Lavoisier's life where he says, as you would not have your reign to resemble that of Robespierre, few as we are who remain disaffected, we hope you had rather gain us by persuasion than silence us by power. This is an unmistakable reference to the beheading of Lavoisier at the guillotine in 1794 at the height of the French revolutionary terror. And then he signed off as follows, with unflagging loyalty to the cause of the French Revolution. He said, I earnestly wish success to the arms of France, which has done me the honor to adopt me when I was persecuted and rejected in my native country. With great satisfaction, therefore, I subscribe myself your fellow citizen, Joseph Priestley. This last passage is a great reminder that Priestley saw a clear political dimension to scientific knowledge and that he saw science as an integral part of social and cultural life. Now I come to the last section of this presentation. So having considered Priestley's stance on phlogiston and oxygen, let us take a fresh view of his general outlook. In science and in religion, Priestley was an advocate of pluralism. Now, this is not to say that he was a relativist, by which I mean someone who does not make any judgments between competing options. Priestley often surely held very strong and distinctive views and argued for them vigorously. And he thought that his beliefs were more likely to be true than other competing beliefs. Yet, he lacked the hubris and arrogance to think that his own views were so surely right as to warrant the suppression of other views. He thought that we would eventually reach the truth best if we would all be allowed to share the facts that we discover and to attempt to persuade others to adopt the views that we held. This to him was the essence of a liberal society of which toleration was the most fundamental principle. No matter how right he thought he was, Priestley would not have dreamt of not allowing Lavoisier to practice his chemistry or not allowing Roman Catholics or atheists from professing their religious views. Now, a liberal society requires a liberal system of education. 
Priestley lamented, I quote, it seems to be a defect in our present system of public education that a pro proper course of studies is not provided for gentlemen who are designed to fill the principal stations of active life, distinct from those which are adapted to the learned professions. Now, these were the opening words of his essay on a course of liberal education for civil and active life, published in 1765 in the middle of his stint teaching at the Warrington Academy. It's a remarkable work. Now, what did he mean by an active life? He says, within the department of active life, I suppose to be comprehended all those stations in which a man's conduct will considerably affect the liberty and the property of his countrymen and the riches, the strength, and the security of his country. And he's speaking in terms of he, but many of you know that he was also an advocate of women's education. So that, that's just his time that he was writing in. Now, one great point of his program of liberal education was the introduction of new subjects, including modern languages, history, and science. The method of teaching he recommends, based on his own successful practice, was also infused with the liberal spirit. He says, let the lecturer give his pupils all encouragement to enter occasionally into the conversation by proposing queries or making any objections or remarks that may occur to them. Upon every subject of importance, let the tutor make references to the principal authors, blah, blah, and let him refer to books written on both sides of the question. And to those who worried that this would lead to interruptions and impertinence, he answered, a proper mixture of dignity and freedom on the part of the lecturer will prevent or repress all impertinent and unreasonable remarks. Don't worry, he says. And then he says this, but suppose a lecturer should not be able immediately to give a satisfactory answer to an objection that might be started by a sensible student. He, the lecturer, must be conscious of his having made very ridiculous pretensions and having given himself improper airs if it give him any pain to tell his class that he will reconsider a subject or even to acknowledge himself mistaken. Now, this is all very modern and liberal, isn't it? I think most of you in this room would agree that this is how one ought to teach. But how many of us actually practice? These uh, pieces of advice, I, I'm not sure. I'm not going to ask too many questions about them. Now, as Chiara Cecchi has argued extensively in her recent PhD dissertation, I recommend this instructive and accessible work to everyone, and you can find it on the internet. Science was an important part of Priestley's vision of liberal education. There are, broadly speaking, in my interpretation, two dimensions to the importance of science in Priestley's vision of liberal education. First, there's the connection between science and technology with the obvious industrial, economic, and social impact of technology. And this was uh, something that uh, members of the Lunar Society in Birmingham particularly emphasized. Secondly, scientific research was a central part of the inquisitive and progressive attitude that an active citizen ought to have. In this sense, the learning of science for Priestley was not so much about the learning of fact, but about learning to learn. This is why experiments were so crucial in Priestley's vision and practice of science and liberal education. From his early days, he had pupils conduct experiments themselves and demonstrate and explain to them to their parents and other visitors to the schools. Now, I think the circumstances of the start of his study of pneumatic chemistry give a perfect illustration of the general character of science as envisioned in Priestley's liberal society. And we begin again with this blue plaque, which is at the side of the Mill Hill Chapel. Uh, you can see this just outside the train station at Leeds. It's not the original location of the chapel, but it's the same congregation. 
Now, Priestley explains in his autobiographical recollections that his study of so-called pneumatic chemistry began when he went to Leeds, which, which was to preach at Mill Hill Chapel, not to do science. But he says he happened to move into a house right next to a brewery. And he made friends with the brewer and got to play around inside. And he discovered, as he puts it in his uh, book to be shown here, in large vessels containing liquors in a state of fermentation, as at a public brewery or distillery, fixed air, our carbon dioxide, may be found in great plenty ready-made. And playing around with the fixed air, he discovered that simply swishing some water around in the presence of fixed air would allow the fixed air to dissolve in it, and it made this fizzy drink. Initially, there is great interest in this because of its medical promises. Right? And that's the focus of this little pamphlet he published called Directions for Impregnating Water with Fixed Air. Because the hope was that this fizzy water would be a cure for all kinds of so-called putrid disorders, including, most importantly, scurvy. And Priestley almost even went on Captain Cook's voyage um, to test this scurvy uh, cure. And he was at, struck out at the last minute because of his religious heterodoxy. That's another whole story. But contrary to his original intentions, artificial carbonation of water made him famous all over Europe because people liked to drink it because previously to this, they could only get it in very particular natural springs. And now anybody could make it at home. And this actually was what brought Priestley first uh, to the attention of Lord Shelburne, who had heard about it while he was traveling in Italy. Now, Mr. Schwepp picked up on this discovery, made his own firm, producing artificially carbonated water. Priestley wasn't interested in making a profit, so there you have the rest of the industrial story on this. This is a famous drawing, which you'll have seen um, in various places. It's Priestley's uh, experimental apparatus for pneumatic chemistry. It's on display in the cabinet in the back. And I want to draw your attention to two things. This is a little plant, and that represents his early experiments uh, leading to the discovery of photosynthesis. And for him, the important thing was that plants were able to revive injured air by animal respiration, as he understood it. And here's the animal. You can't really see it, so here's a blown up picture. It's the head of a mouse, and I, there's another one. And I'm not quite sure whether this is a mouse as well. You decide. And here we have a nice modern representation of one of Priestley's remarkable experiments, enclosing in the same confined space a mouse and a sprig of mint, and noticing that the mouse was able to live in it for much longer than it was able to do without the mint. And this, we may say, is just a nice scientific discovery. For Priestley, it was much more than that. This was the proof of providence. Because when he first discovered that air would become infected, as he called it, or, or phlogisticated, by animals breathing in it, he despaired. He said, we're all going to die. <laughs> because all of us animals, including humans, keep breathing, and we're going to just completely mess up the air on the entire planet, and then we will all die. And how could God have allowed this? And then he discovered the action of the plants and said, of course, God would not have had us all perish. And this also led into a whole social program of eudiometry, 
uh, with his so-called nitrous air test, checking for measuring the goodness of air, a long story for which I don't have time today. Let me close now with a few reflections on what made Priestley so special and different from other great scientists and humanists. One thing we should never lose sight of is the religious dimension of his life and work, without which our picture of Priestley would be woefully inadequate. The pursuit of religious truth was what Priestley considered most important and pleasurable about his work, and everything else, including science, was secondary in importance. Therefore, Priestley's outlook, though very modern in many ways, was very different from the secular sensibilities of Lavoisier and the French revolutionaries, according to which science was the way to understand and dominate nature in a rational way. Priestley's science was infused by humility as he faced nature, which for him represented God. From such humility followed pluralism, based on the recognition that any given attempt at understanding nature is so limited and uncertain that other attempts ought to be given a chance too. Again, nothing could be farther from the truth than, than the popular image of Priestley as a dogmatic defender of phlogiston. His whole life was spent in advocacy of tolerance, religious, political, and scientific. It was quite common for scientists at the time to confess that they did not have the final story about the universe, but Priestley had a particularly instructive notion of humility, which was dynamic. And I want to close this presentation by showing you that vision of dynamic humility. So this is what Priestley says. Every discovery brings to our view many things of which we had no intimation before. He had a wonderful image for this, which was geometric. That's the next quotation on that slide. The greater is the circle of light, the greater is the boundary of the darkness by which it is confined. So as knowledge grows, so does ignorance. And I made a little picture of it myself. So dark sea of darkness in which we have a little circle of light which represents our knowledge. What happens when that circle gets big? The area of light grows, but so does the boundary of the lit up area, which represents ignorance. Now, all the darkness represents ignorance, but that's the kind of ignorance that we don't even know about. <laughs> That's Donald Rumsfeld's unknown, unknown. <laughs> Red circle here is the area of ignorance that we can actually tackle. That's where scientific research happens. And this made Priestley happy. So he continued after saying the previous statement. But notwithstanding this, the more light we get, the more thankful we ought to be. For by this means, we have the greater range for satisfactory contemplation. In time, the bounds of light will be still farther extended. And from the infinity of the divine nature and the divine works, we may promise ourselves an endless progress in our investigation of them, a prospect truly sublime and glorious. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hasek, very much for that. Now, we've got about 10 or 15 minutes for questions. So, can I have questions from the floor, please? Well, whilst you're thinking of one, I'll... Yes. Right, uh, sorry. <laughs> can you speak up, please? Yes. I was just wondering if you... What you were saying about... Um, Priestley and his uh, refusal to stick to one hypothesis and keep following it, or at least his, his, his keenness to change when it, when it was appropriate, mm. might have affected his uh, 
the way historians view him, because it does make him very hard to read. Yes. <laughs> yes, I, I agree that that is a significant factor for anyone who's tried to study Priestley's own writings. I mean, there's no way that any of us can read all of it. There's so much on any given subject. It is said that, well, he claims to have written as fast as his handwriting could keep up. And he claims he didn't often proofread what he wrote. So there's a lot of it. And in his experimental philosophy, he just gives you an account of every experiment he does in that order. And then he gives you the interpretation that occurs to him at the time. And then that changes later, as you say. It's impossible to make any sense of it if you're not really persistent and if you're not tuned in with his way of thinking. So I think that's a great difficulty. And that, I really think, was a great advantage that Lavoisier had. I tried to read Lavoisier. It's crystal clear, very crisp prose. It's all laid out systematically. So it's a relief, right? But I don't think there's a good enough reason to uh, disregard what Priestley is saying. But I think it is a great factor. Gentlemen there, please, with glasses. <clears throat> Did the, the phlogistonist came up with the negative mass concept? Uh, did Priestley support that? No, no, Priestley uh, didn't support that idea. Mostly the phlogiston people thought phlogiston had no weight, plus or minus. There is uh, one famous person who came up with the idea of negative weight. And that's actually not so stupid. This is Guiton, Guiton de Morveau, who later becomes Lavoisier's, one of Lavoisier's three best colleagues. But before he turns, when he was still a phlogistonist, he says, look, if phlogiston is really light, namely lighter than air, and we're weighing everything in air, when you add phlogiston, things are going to get apparently lighter. Like if you're trying to weigh Put, if you put a balance on the water, say, and you're putting balloons filled with air on one side, it would go up, even though the absolute weight of that side has increased by the addition of the balloons. Right. So Guiton had the idea that phlogiston has relative negative weight in air, which is a perfectly sensible thing to do. But uh, when you make the precise measurements, you, you figure out that doesn't work out. But there are not many phlogiston theorists who seriously entertain the idea of the so-called levity of phlogiston. And that's a, a little piece of entertaining history that that's got into the folklore, as it were. And it, it gets repeated many, many times. Any more questions? As a fellow of the Royal Society, Joseph Priestley must have spent quite a long time from time to time in London. Did he in fact? And can you tell us anything about that? Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, the, the general thing to say is that the fellows of Royal Society didn't all spend much time in London. And John Dalton would be a good example of someone who didn't. Priestley did spend much time in London for a while, namely while he was attached to Lord Shelburne, because he followed Shelburne to London during the London season and went to the country house uh, during the summer. So he did spend much time in London, which was very useful for him, partly because he met people like Benjamin Franklin here in London and got much help from Frank Franklin on his or on electricity, which was the first major piece of scientific research that Priestley did. And he also met other important people, for example, the uh, Reverend Richard Price, one of his best associates in the uh, dissenting circles. And eventually, it was the Price connection that secured him the position of a minister at Hackney after he was turned out from Birmingham. But that didn't work out perfectly, so he goes on to America. But yes, he, he did spend quite a bit of time in London, but I think not that much in the Royal Society. And his autobiographical remarks hint at um, 
a degree of shunning after the Birmingham riots that he came down to London and most of his friends in the Royal Society would not see him. So it's a mixed bag there. I get the impression he corresponded a little bit with Henry Cavendish, but not a lot, and virtually not at all with, with Joseph Black. So mm. in, in chemistry, I sometimes think he was a rather solitary individual. Yes, yes, that, that's a very interesting point. Uh, I don't have a good story about why Priestley and Black didn't correspond much. Somebody who will have an answer to that is Robert Anderson, who has just brought out an edited collection of Black's correspondence, or uh, worth reading. I, I haven't plowed through it myself to have anything insightful to add on that. As for Cavendish, um, they did correspond. Yeah, yeah. They did exchange views quite closely about the nature of phlogiston, about the experiments on the calcination and reduction of metals, about the composition of water. And there's good evidence that Priestley was quite strongly guided by Cavendish's views about inflammable air. Cavendish was an antisocial man. He did correspond, but he wouldn't have hung out with Priestley. Priestley, on the other, other hand, loved to sit by the fireside and chat to friends for hours. So I think that they were very different uh, people. And I think Priestley would have been much too radical yes. for Cavendish's taste uh, in, in the political and religious sense. Gentlemen there. Could you just wait for the microphone, right. please? One of the points you made was that uh, carbonated water became very popular. Yes. Now, this is not a question, but it's a point of uh, information that some people may find interesting subsequently. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a small museum in the city of Bath where when you visit that museum, it shows you the history of a small company that went, took that task up of making carbonated water mm. and selling it at a quite a high price to the nobility. Mm -hmm. uh, and as it became more and more popular, they then had to expand production. And so you're taken through the initial way in which they made the, the carbonated water right the way through to when it became more industrialized. Mm. Eventually, because carbonated water became so popular, they got pushed out of business because there were people who invented an even bigger and better process. Yeah. Um, but there is a small museum. Unfortunately, I've forgotten the name of it, but it is in the city of Bath. In Bath, Bath yes. You find it on the internet. That would certainly be worth a visit. Thank you. Priestley's original method was, was very simple. He, he says, uh, he, ex he explains all these details to you in his books, the point of which is that he wants you to do it <laughs> at home, if you can. And um, he says, you just take two little vessels and pour water from one to the other inside the layer of fixed air. And that's enough. Do it for a few minutes, he says. And apparently Mr. Schwepp didn't think that was good enough. And Schwepp could reach a higher degree of carbonation than naturally found sparkling mineral water. So the industrial story is quite interesting as well. Thank you. One more question, if there is one. Uh, Dr. Zook, please. Thank you. Um, Alan, you anticipated what I was going to say to some extent. My own he hero of this period is Joseph Black. And I would have thought that his very brilliant distinction between degree of heat and quantity of heat would have been a gift to these chaps mm. who presumably would be looking for the answer degree of what? Degree sorry, of degree of phlogiston or sorry quantity ah, yeah, of yeah. what? Quantity yeah. of phlogiston or quantity of caloric. Mm. But somehow they seem to have neglected or... or yes, yeah, 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 thank you. There are a couple of different things to say about that. One is that Lavoisier certainly built on Black's work on heat, right? And Black was non-committal about the ultimate nature of heat, so he didn't go in for caloric, but Lavoisier thought that uh, Black's 
concept of latent heat, for example, was a very useful thing, and he gave a quite chemical interpretation of that, as you probably know, and he said when caloric combines with ordinary matter and takes this latent form, that's why we have latent heat, and so on. And yes, degree of heat and the amount of heat maps on very nicely to the temperature and, and the quantity of heat concept. So I would say Black's work was directly relevant to Lavoisier's work on heat and, and much else, of course. Now, did Priestley take up the same way of thinking for talking about degrees of phlogistication? Well, I think he tried, because he does say that when you take air and give it more and more phlogiston, it right, goes from dephlogisticated air to common air to fixed air to nitrous air. Right? He has a whole degree of a series of phlogistication, but although he tried to precisely quantify this, it never worked out. So I think it wasn't for want of trying, but, but it never quite worked out for phlogiston, and you might fairly say that this is one of the reasons why phlogiston didn't get very far. Um, Another aspect of Black's work we should mention uh, was his pioneering research on fixed air, which uh, Priestley directly builds on. But there's an interesting story about how that might have actually um, got in the way of reaching the more convenient interpretations of the oxygen experiments. But, but I'll, I'll spare you <laughs> the details of that until coffee time. Thank you. Well, some of you may know that we opened the doors of this building in September or October as part of the open house weekend. Members of the public can come in and admire our lovely rooms. But rather than looking at acres and acres of bookcases, I have proposed in the past that we should perhaps entertain them with some chemistry, this being the Royal Society of Chemistry. And in my proposition, I said we should be giving little 15-minute lectures on the phlogiston theory using Priestley's and other experiments to, confirm, to convince them of its existence. So I can imagine a succession of people going out into the courtyard from the Royal Society of Chemistry in the 21st century believing in the truth of the theory of phlogiston. Well, we have had an a very entertaining and informative session this evening and we have to thank those responsible for those mounting it and doing all the behind the scenes administration we thank Chiara Chetsi and Pauline Meakin so let's give them a round of applause <laughs> but before we go outside to coffee we have to thank our lecturer this evening. Professor Hasek Chan, very provocative, very informative, but above all, very enjoyable. Thank you very much. Thank you.